Welcome to Old World Order Theology with Brian Newberry, and yes, I have the hat to go with the show. And today we're going to talk about hell. More specifically, can we dare to hope that hell is empty? Now, I know this is an unpleasant topic, and perhaps I'm suggesting an unpleasant reality check. Uh, can we disbelieve something just because we don't want to believe it? Uh, for example, I believe that electricity should be free for everyone. Therefore, I don't have to pay my electricity bill. Well, guess what happens if I don't pay my electricity bill? The lights go out and the show is over. So you don't get to change reality just because you don't like something. And just because we don't like to hear about hell, it doesn't mean it's not real. It doesn't mean that people can't go there. I mean, I do realize it gives us the warm fuzzies to hear how much God loves us and how much he did uh, to save us by sending his only son into this world to die for our sins. He wants to bless us and be with us for all of eternity. And all those things are 100% true. But, and this is a big but, and the bigger the but, the better the conversation. Hell is something that Jesus talked about quite a lot in the Gospels, right? And unfortunately, it's an unpleasant reality that we have to deal with. So what are the typical attitudes about hell in the general society? I mean, most people, because we have an ingrained sense of justice, uh, we most people will believe that hell exists, but perhaps only real, really, really bad people go. People like Hitler, Stalin, uh, Mao, and perhaps they're saving a seat for Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump or whichever politicians we don't like. Uh, but for the most part, because of the self-esteem movement, uh, and you know, we like to think of ourselves as good, we don't think that people really go to hell. Uh, and we, even when we do bad things, we usually justify it. Uh, we'll, we say things like, well, uh, I've been done wrong. Uh, there's been these injustices happening to me all my life, so I feel like I deserve to have some pleasure to make up for it. Or, oh, I might be bad, but I'm not as bad as those guys. You know, so it's relativism. You know, the reference point, you always point to those who are worse than us. And that actually comes uh, from original sin in Genesis chapter 3, when Eve and Adam ate the fruit. Uh, God said, Adam, what have you done? He said, it was the woman that you gave me, God. And then he said, woman, what have you done? Oh, it was the serpent who tricked me. And ironically, the serpent is the only one who doesn't make an excuse and blame someone else. Uh, go figure. So why am I talking about this? There are dozens of other topics I could have chosen instead of this one. So am I a doom and gloom uh, prophet uh, who likes to talk about bad things uh, just to get a reaction out of people. Well, the main reason why I'm uh, tackling this topic is because there are a lot of uh, clergy in the Catholic Church, and specifically there is an auxiliary bishop who's very popular out of Los Angeles, who's teaching that, that perhaps hell is empty or it's at least uh, less populated than uh, the church has always taught it was. And and really going against tradition. You know, it's kind of that modernist concept that, yeah, we used to teach that, but now we're more enlightened and more evolved, and we want to be nice to people, and we don't want to talk about hell. So let's come up with a theory that perhaps all of the theologians over the last 2,000 years are wrong, and that we're much more smarter than them because, hey, we have more resources, we could analyze things better, we have better philosophy, and we're more educated. So maybe everyone else was wrong and now we're right. Uh, but if that's true, then, you know, 100 years from now, maybe they'll say the same thing about us. And then before you know it, no one was right. Everybody's wrong and we might as well be agnostics at that point. That's why we have to reject that line of thinking here at Old World Order Theology. Because once you start down that path, uh, there's really no truth at all. That it's all relative and whatever your opinion is or whoever can debate a topic the best, uh, that opinion is the truth. And that's just garbage. So where did this uh, popular bishop, where did he get this idea? Well, it actually came from a very popular theologian in the 20th century named Hans Urs von Balthasar. Now, this is a book that someone gave me to read, and being the polite person that I am, I read it, and 
didn't like it. Uh, my first impression was this is a person, one of those people who tries to sound intellectual by using a lot of unnecessary big words and a lot of footnotes, uh, references to philosophers and theologians of the past, and even those who are quite irrelevant uh, to any Catholic discussion on the issue. And, you know, let me uh, just highlight some of the things that he uh, brings up and discusses and some of the methods he uses in his book. Let's see. First of all, he quotes from sources, Gnostic sources. Now, anyone knows anything about Gnosticism? It was one of the first early heresies, uh, you know, that were competing with the Catholic Church. Uh, and then also quotes from the New Testament apocryphal books, uh, books that were not included in the Bible because they weren't written by apostles or close associates, and they were uh, usually second or third century writings uh, that might have had the names of apostles or their associates to try to give it a look of uh, authenticity. So von Balthasar uses these quotes to try to make his case, which is very strange. And he also quotes from a man named René Guénon, who is an occultist, Freemason, expert in metaphysics. Why a Catholic would ever quote a Freemason, who is an arch enemy, a vowed enemy of the Catholic Church, beyond me. And he taught also that creation and redemption as a unity, not distinctive things, and that the natural realm and the supernatural realm, uh, that they're really the same thing. So that goes under the heresy of naturalism. Uh, so that, you know, those are the people who read the Bible and they explain away all the miracles using science and natural phenomena. They weren't really miracles. Jesus didn't really walk on water. He just walked on a frozen lake. Uh, he didn't really create, uh, he didn't really feed 5,000 people out of uh, five loaves and two fishes. They were just sharing their lunch. Those kind of people. Quacks, all of them. And let's see, what else? Uh, von Balthasar, he also, the sole topic here quoted, he says, an uninter uninterrupted charismatic reinterpretation of the cross, which has run through the centuries of the church's life, uh, page 76. So basically, he's trying to prove the theory of an evolution of dogma or evolution of doctrine. And he, he'll quote here and there from these mystics, these saints, to try to prove his case. And also taught that hell is primarily an inner condition uh, and not a location. He tries to argue that. And he also proposes that when Christ descended into hell, 1 Peter chapter 3, and that when he was preaching to the souls in prison, that this was a salvific act, that he went to go save them. When you read the passage, it's obviously uh, referring to a condemnation, that he's giving them the prison sentence and telling them why they will be condemned for all of eternity. So he tries to use uh, sophistry to uh, kind of flip that around. And then he also assumes Persian and Hellenistic influence of Ju the Judaic uh, beliefs of the afterlife, and that these are also reflected in the New Testament. So basically he's saying that these aren't revelations from God that we see in the Bible, that these were just theologians uh, trying to make uh, reality up the best that they could according to their reason, and that, that it came from within themselves and not from the God out there, the transcendent God who revealed it to them. So he's basically saying that the Bible is not really inspired by God any more than it is by intelligent men. And he also assumes all descriptions of the afterlife are the same place without distinctions. We'll talk about that in a minute. And, oh, here's the, here's the big quote. I want to read it directly from the book. Page 168 where von Balthasar says, Here too, and here especially, it is important to examine critically the many fragments of tradition and to reassemble them in a manner different from that which is long customary. So, in other words, he's saying, let's pick and choose, like at 31 Flavors, Baskin-Robbins, or the buffet line, that which is fitting to our contemporary ideas, and let's disregard the rest, and let's reassemble a theology of hell which is different than what the church has always taught. So clearly, and then in a few pages later, he, he admits that he's breaking with tradition and he's going against the scholastic theologians like St. Thomas Aquinas, Augustine, and all them. So he's, he's confessing that he's breaking with tradition. 
and this popular bishop in Los Angeles also confesses that he disagrees with Saint Augustine, Saint Thomas Aquinas and the Scholastics, and basically all the saints and the Bible itself uh, saying that, well, that's what they believed in, and maybe we misunderstood it all these years, so, aha, I'm here to save the day and tell you what the Bible really meant, what Jesus really meant, and they were all wrong. That's what von Balthasar and this popular bishop are really trying to say. And now I've made the claim, so say, well, prove it. What does the Bible say about hell? Now, first of all, I will confess that in the early books of the Old Testament, there are literal, little or no references to the afterlife. That's just a fact. Uh, little or none. Uh, the basic belief was that there's this place called Sheol, which in various transli translations of the Bible, sometimes translated as hell, some as the netherworld, some as uh, Hades, this or that, depending on which translation. And they generally believe that all souls of all people, when they died, they went there. And the righteous went to one place, and the unrighteous went to another. That was kind of the basic concept. So let me read some of the passages from the Old Testament. And, and you might even say there is somewhat of a developed understanding of it. Uh, Psalm chapter 9, verses 17 and 18. I'm reading from the Dewey Rames uh, translation, which is the translation of the Latin Vulgate. The Lord shall be known when he executes judgments. The sinner hath been caught in the works of his own hands. The wicked shall be turned into hell, all the nations that forget God. So, no exceptions. Proverbs chapter 23, verses 13 and 14. It says, Withhold not the correction from a child. For if thou strike him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod, and deliver his soul from hell. So obviously, whether you spank a child or not, because it's referring to corporal punishment here, whether you spank a child or not, he's going to die physically. So obviously, the writer of Proverbs, presumably Solomon, is not referring to natural death. He's referring to eternal death. He's saying, if you strike him with the rod, he shall not die. And if you beat him with the rod, and you will deliver his soul from hell, eternal death. So he's saying that spanking is good. Corporal punishment is good. And that can actually deliver a child from hell. You know, it's, it's part of his training and discipline. So it's only the moderns with all their enlightenment and evolution that we know better than that. Uh, we don't do that. We like to encourage them and build them up and make them feel good about themselves. And that's what's good. That's what moderns say. And it's interesting, too, to note that the Church of Satan is also against corporal punishment of children. So, because they know. All right, Isaiah chapter 33, verse 14 says, The sinners in Zion are afraid. Trembling has seized upon the hypocrites. Which of you can dwell with devouring fire? Which of you shall dwell with everlasting burnings? So the prophet Isaiah is giving uh, an allusion to the everlasting and the burning nature of hell. And then in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, the prophet refers to the resurrection and then the judgment. He says, And many of those that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some unto life everlasting, and others unto reproach, to see it always. Some translations will say everlasting reproach or everlasting condemnation. So here we have the resurrection and judgment, some into heaven, eternal life, some into hell, eternal reproach and condemnation. That's Old Testament. And you might be a surprise to learn that nobody in the New Testament talks about hell more than Jesus Christ. And this would make sense if Jesus Christ is truly the eternal Son of God, then no one would know more about hell than him. Uh, so the first passage in Matthew, and by the way, the Gospel of Matthew, the first Gospel, refers to hell no less than 30 times, even more if you interpret certain parables a certain way. But uh, the first passage in Matthew is actually from John the Baptist, who makes reference to Jesus. Chapter 3, verses 11 and 12, he says, I indeed baptize you in water unto penance, that he that shall come after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you in the Holy Ghost and fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly cleanse his floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. 
Now, a lot of the modern notions of Jesus, uh, the baby boomers, they like to see him as John Lennon, you know, all we need is love. And then you have South Park Jesus, who's this nice guy, but he's kind of wimpy, never confrontational, uh, definitely wouldn't condemn anyone to everlasting and unquenchable fire. Uh, but that's not the Jesus of the Bible, not the Jesus of history. The Jesus of the real Jesus of history and the Jesus of the Bible is a, a fiery apocalyptic prophet who you know is very confrontational and will talk about hell and the many people that go there quite frequently, as we are about to see. So a second passage, this is Jesus speaking now, and pay close attention, especially men. This applies to us. Uh, more so than women. He says, But I say to you that, chapter 5, verses 28 through 30, I say to you that whosoever shall look on a woman to lust after her hath already committed adultery with her in his heart. And if thy right eye scandalize thee, or cause you to, skin, cause you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is expedient for thee that one of thy members should perish, rather than thy whole body be cast into hell. And if thy right hand scandalize thee, or cause you to sin, cut it off, and cast it from thee. For it is expedient for thee that one of thy members should perish, rather than that thy whole body go into hell. So, let's pay attention. So he says, any man who lusts after another woman has committed adultery with her in his heart. So, number one, lust. And then he says, if your right eye causes you to sin or scandalizes you to, to pluck out your eye, that it's better to go to heaven with one eye than to hell with two eyes. And then after the eye, he says, if your right hand causes you to sin or scandalizes you, cut your hand off. It's better to go into heaven with one hand than with two hands to go into hell. So lust, eyes, hands. Men, we know what this is. And we're busted. Don't have to spell it out. Yes, that is a sin that is a mortal sin and can cause you to go to hell. Not a popular belief, I know. Okay, next passage. Uh, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. This is Jesus now. It says, Enter ye in at the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and broad that leads to destruction, and many there who go in. How narrow is the gate, and straight is the way that leads to life, and few are those who find it. Now, so he's saying the gate is wide, and the broad way is easy, and that leads to destruction. And he says many go to that gate, but the gate is narrow and straight that leads to life, and few are those who find it. Now, the basic face value principle of this passage is from Jesus himself, more people go to hell than go to heaven. Now, that's not a popular belief. It's not very nice for the self-esteem, but it's one of those unpleasant realities that we have to conform to if we're followers of the truth. And that old world theology, old world order theology, that's what we do here. Next passage, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 8, verses 11 and 12. Jesus says, that many shall come from the east and from the west, and shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into the exterior darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So not only is hell fiery, it's also dark. And lots of crying and gnashing but from the pain, gnashing of teeth. Uh, another one, Matthew chapter 25, verses 41 through 46. Then he shall say to them also that shall be on his left hand, Depart from me, you accursed. Now he's speaking of the, the last judgment here. Into everlasting fire, which was prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me not to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me not to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in. Naked, and you covered me not. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. And then they shall answer him, saying, Lord, when do we see thee hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and not minister to thee? Then he shall answer them, saying, Amen, I say to you, as long as you did not do it to one of these least, neither did you do it to me. 
and these shall go into everlasting punishment, but the just shall go into life everlasting. So Jesus refers to this judgment of the wicked, everlasting fire. And notice it wasn't based on their faith alone. It was on what they did with their faith. So yes, our works and our good deeds matter. And our lack of good works and our deeds are hell worthy. So not only is it transgression that leads us into hell, it is the lack of charity. So that is something uh, to be fearful, and St. Paul does say, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So yes, we need to be afraid of not being obedient to God, in other words. Obedience matters. And then you have Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, verses 23-31. He says, And lifting up his eyes when he was in torments, he, the rich man, saw Abraham afar off, and Lazarus, who was a poor man, in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water to cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And Abraham said to him, Son, remember that thou didst receive many good things in thy lifetime, and likewise Lazarus received evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a fixed, a great chasm, so that they who would pass from hence to you cannot, nor from thence can come hither. And he said, then, the, this is the rich man speaking, Then, Father Abraham, I beseech thee that thou wouldst send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify unto them, so lest they also come into this place of torments. And Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets, meaning they have the scriptures. Let them hear them. But he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one went to them from the dead, then they will do penance. And he said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, then neither will they believe, even if one rises again from the dead. So in other words, uh, the rich man has no excuse. He knew the scriptures. He knew what Moses taught. He knew what the prophets taught, and he neglected his duty to take care of the poor, being a rich man. So the rich have that obligation to take care of those less fortunate than them. And it didn't even say that he did anything particularly wicked. It just says that he was greedy and selfish, and that was worthy of being in torment. Now, this is before uh, the advent of Christ. So this is the Old Testament uh, version of uh, the netherworld, or Sheol, where you have the, the poor man who was treated like crap all of his life, he went to the bosom of Abraham to be comforted. Uh, and then on the other side of the chasm uh, was the rich man who was in torment, in agony, in the flame. So that's pretty scary stuff. So what about St. Paul? Did he, have, did he ever talk about hell? Not quite as often, but he did. Second Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, verses 7-9, through 9, And he says, To you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with the angels of his power. He's referring to the second coming here. In a flame of fire, giving vengeance to them who know not God, and who obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall suffer eternal punishment and destruction from the face of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Now notice he says that Jesus himself is... Uh, making vengeance on those who do not know him or the gospel and do not obey the gospel. So Jesus is not coming as a nice guy. He's coming back uh, to punish and as, a, as a, a, a warrior. He's coming to slay his enemies. And then you have the book of the Apocalypse, better known as Revelation, chapter 14, verses 9 through 11. And it says, The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man shall adore the beast and his image and receive his character in his forehead or in his hand, he shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mingled with pure wine in the cup of his wrath, and shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the sight of the holy angels and in the sight of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torments shall ascend up forever and ever. Neither have they rest, day nor night, who have adored the beast and his image, and whoever receiveth the character of his name. Some translations say the mark of his name. The 666, that thing. So, yes, notice, notice it says, They are tormented with fire and brimstone, day and night, without any rest, in the presence of the angels and in the sight of the Lamb. So, 
Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, is present in their torment. So that may not sound like the Jesus that you want to believe in, but this is the Jesus of the Bible. Uh, Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. This is the final judgment. And he says, I saw a great white throne and one sitting upon it, and whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was no place found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing in the presence of the throne. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged by those things which were written in the books according to their works. Yes, works matter. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and the death and hell gave up their dead that were in them, and they were judged, everyone according to their works. And hell and death were cast into the pool of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the pool of fire. But the fearful... This is now Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, they shall have their portion in the pool burning with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So notice, the fearful go to hell. So what does that mean? Those who knew what was right and who are too afraid to speak up for the truth because of what other people would think about them. Oh, I'm afraid to preach the truth, to preach the gospel, because people will think I'm nuts. They'll think I'm crazy. They'll think I'm an extremist, a right-winger. Those who are fearful of other people's opinions and who will not do the right thing, go to hell. The unbelieving, go to hell. Uh, the abominable, 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 Sorry, tongue twister. Murderers, whoremongers, fornicators, and so. Sorcerers, uh, which is witchcraft, uh, the occult. It's also interesting that the theologian von Balthasar also wrote the, the afterword of uh, a book on the occult. Let me get the title for you, so in case you don't believe me, you can look it up. It's called Meditations on the Tarot, A Journey into Christian Hermeticism. Uh, if you're not familiar with what tarot is, it's referring to tarot cards, which is uh, an occult practice of divination, which is strictly condemned in uh, the Bible, condemned by the church always. Uh, the occult, uh, new agey stuff, uh, crystal balls, uh, palm reading, uh, yoga, uh, all that has to do with occultic and uh, paganistic practices. So... Uh, in this book, they try to blend Christianity with these practices by saying that they're okay. And according to the Bible and church tradition, this is uh, I, this is witchcraft, sorcery, uh, the occult, not good. So again, why this bishop would want to quote von Balthasar and allude to him as a great scholar and theologian is beyond me. And then idolatry, which is violation of the first commandment, having any other God besides the true God, which also refers to false religions, and all liars, so lying is a hell-worthy sin if you don't repent, and they shall have their portion in the pool burning with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So, uh, I mean, we've all done some of these things in our life, uh, so we have, uh, we have to repent and do penance, and go to confession, get absolved from these sins. So otherwise we go to hell. So that's uh, that's an overview of some of the more strong scriptural passages about hell. So what about uh, Catholic tradition? What does tradition teach? Well, let's first go with uh, one of the greatest uh, visions of the Blessed Virgin Mary ever recorded in history, which was also vindicated by the miracle of the sun, Our Lady of Fatima in 1917, who appeared to the three children in Portugal, uh, Sister Lucia being the, the most famous of these. And the first secret uh, revealed to the children, the Blessed Virgin Mary, you know, we refer to her as the mother of the church, mother of God, the Atokos, uh, who is kind and gentle, and you know, in, you know, for some uh, perceived as more gentle than Jesus. Well, guess what? And her first uh, revelation to the children, her first vision, does she begin with telling them how much God loves them? Nope. She begins with hell. 
Sorry to disappoint you. So let me quote uh, from what Sister Lucia wrote about the vision. Uh, she says, and this is quote from the Vatican website, Our Lady showed us a great sea of fire which seemed to be under the earth. Plunged in this fire were demons and souls in human form, like transparent burning embers, all blackened or burnished bronze, floating about in the conflagration, now raised into the air by the flames that issued from within themselves together with great clouds of smoke, now falling back on every side like sparks in a huge fire, without weight or equilibrium, and amid shrieks and groans of pain and despair, which horrified us and made us tremble with fear. The demons could be distinguished by their terrifying and repulsive likeness to frightful and unknown animals, all black and transparent. This vision lasted but an instant. How can we ever be grateful enough to our kind Heavenly Mother, who had already prepared us by promising in the first apparition to take us to heaven? Otherwise, I think we would have died of fear and terror. We then looked up at Our Lady, who said to us so kindly and so sadly, and this is a quote from the Blessed Virgin Mary. She says, You have seen hell where the souls of poor sinners go. To save them, God wishes to establish in the world devotion to my immaculate heart. If what I say to you is done, many souls will be saved, and there will be peace. The war is going to end. She's referring to uh, World War I. But if people do not cease offending God, a worse one, a worse war, will break out during the pontificate of Pius XI. That was reference to the future World War II. Not yet uh, happening. When you see a knight illumined by an unknown light, know that this is a great sign given to you by God, that he is about to punish the world for its crimes by means of war, famine, and persecutions of the church and of the Holy Father. To prevent this, I shall come to ask for the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart and the communion of reparation on the first Saturdays. If my requests are heeded, Russia will be converted, and there will be peace. If not, she will spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecutions of the church. The good will be martyred. The Holy Father will have much to suffer. Various nations will be annihilated. In the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. The Holy Father, meaning the Pope, will consecrate Russia to me, and she will be converted, and a period of peace will be granted to the world." Well, guess what? These requests by Our Lady were not heeded. The Pope never uh, consecrated Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, which is uh, through the heart of Christ. And the errors of Russia were indeed spread throughout the world. Now, remember, this vision was given in the year 1917. And what happened with Russia in 1917? The revolution, the communist revolution, same year. Coincidence? I think not. So what are the errors of Russia that were spread throughout the world? Communism, socialism. And yes, indeed, throughout the 20th century, this was the biggest threat uh, to the free world and to the Catholic Church. And yes, many Catholics were martyred and persecuted by the communists, all, not only in Russia and Eastern Europe, but also throughout South America and Mexico. So uh, this vision was by Our Lady was quite prophetic. Uh, it was given to her by God to give to the children. It wasn't her own. She wasn't acting apart from Christ. So don't let anyone tell you otherwise. So that's that. And she proved her vision with prophecy and also the miracle of the sun. So what about other Catholic traditions? What do they have to say? Now here is a source called The Sources of Catholic Dogma by Denzinger. Very valuable source to have. It's a great companion to have next to the Bible. It has all the early creeds and all the councils and all the papal, not all the papal encyclicals, but the most important ones. So you can have a line of tradition from the time of the apostles all the way into the present day unbroken. So you can see the consistency of the doctrines of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. So what do they have to say about hell? I'm not going to read all of them, just some of them for the sake of time. Okay, now the first goes back to the 4th century. 
to a man named St. Athanasius, and eventually there was a creed called the Athanasius Creed. So I'm going to give a quote in one part, and then I'll skip a bunch, and then have another quote for expediency. He says, Whoever wishes to be saved needs above all to hold to the Catholic faith. Unless each one preserves this whole and inviolate, he will without a doubt perish in eternity. Meaning, whole and inviolate, meaning they have to believe all the doctrines of the Catholic Church. According to the Catholic teaching, if you disbelieve one teaching, official teaching of the Catholic Church, not opinions, uh, dogmas, then you're not Catholic and you are you risk eternal damnation. So you can't say, well, I agree with 90% of what the Church teaches, but this thing about artificial birth control, I don't believe it personally. Well, guess what? You're inviolate of the, of the doctrine of the Catholic Church. Well, I believe a woman has a right to choose to have an abortion. Well, guess what? You're contradicting the uh, doctrine of the church, which was received from Jesus Christ and the apostles. Or whatever uh, you know, your preference, you, your idea that you have the freedom to choose, to believe in what to disbelieve, uh, the church of Christ offers no such freedom. And later in the Athanasian Creed, it says, But it is necessary for eternal salvation that he faithfully believe also the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accordingly, it is the right faith that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is God and man. And then it goes into the details of his divinity. And then, uh, then it says, At his coming, Jesus' second coming, all men have to rise again with their bodies and will render an account for their own deeds. And those who have done good will go into life everlasting, but those who have done evil into eternal fire. This is the Catholic faith. Unless everyone believes this faithfully and firmly, he cannot be saved. And this is early. This isn't a later medieval uh, forgery. It's not a later uh, development, uh, a made-up doctrine. It wasn't an addition. It wasn't a corruption. This is what the Catholic Church has always taught. It's in the scriptures. It's in the early teachings of the church. Okay, then next one. We'll go to the Council of Valence in the year 855. Okay, he's talking about uh, predestination, free will, and, and all that. Yeah. And talking about in the same sense, the same one says elsewhere, in the revelation of the Lord Jesus from heaven with the angels of his power in a flame of fire, giving vengeance to them who know not God and who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall suffer eternal punishment and destruction. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be made wonderful in all them who have believed, certainly neither do we believe that the foreknowledge of God has placed a necessity on any wicked man so that he cannot be different. But what that one would be from his own will as God who knew all things before they are, he foreknew from his omnipotent and immutable majesty. Neither do we believe that anyone is condemned by a previous judgment on the part of God, but by reason of his own iniquity. Nor do we believe that any wicked thus perished because they were not able to do good. But because they were unwilling to be good, they have remained by their own vice in the mass of damnation, either by reason of original sin or even by actual sin. So here this condemns the idea that God predestined people to hell. Uh, there's no excuse. Everyone has the ability. God gives everyone the grace and the ability to repent of their sins and to believe the gospel. But according to the teachings of the Catholic Church, uh, uh, many do not believe this, and they suffer eternal damnation. Next one, uh, referring to the effect of baptism. This is an encyclical, encyclical by Pope Innocent III in the year 1206, ex parte tua. And he says, We say that a distinction must be made that sin is twofold, namely original sin and actual sin. Original, which is contracted without consent, meaning we inherit it. An actual sin, which is committed with consent, meaning we have to know that it is a sin and we still do it anyway. Original sin, therefore, which is committed without consent, is remitted without consent through the power of the sacrament of baptism. But actual sin, which is contracted with consent, is not mitigated in the slightest without consent. So, you know, that's why we baptize babies. Uh, the baptism 
uh, cleanses us from original sin that we received from Adam and Eve. Um, so without that baptism, the original sin uh, is on the soul and it will prevent us from going to heaven. So then he continues, The punishment of original sin is deprivation of the vision of God, but the punishment of actual sin is the torments of everlasting hell. Pretty clear. Next one. The Fourth Lateran Council, the year 1215. says, But Jesus descended his, in soul, and he arose in the flesh, and he ascended equally in both, to come at the end of time to judge the living and the dead, and to render to each according to his works, to the wicked as well as to the elect, all of whom will rise with their bodies, which they now bear, that they may receive according to their works, whether these works have been good or evil, the latter everlasting punishment with the devil, and the former everlasting glory with Christ. Very simple. Next one. This is the Council of Lyons in the year 1245. It says, Moreover, if anyone without repentance dies in mortal sin, without a doubt he is tortured forever by the flames of eternal hell. Now, what is a mortal sin, and how is that different from a regular sin, or what's called a venial sin? Mortal sins are basically uh, some kind of violation of the Ten Commandments, and those which are, are sins that lead unto death, according to the Apostle John in his first epistle. They are the sins that lead to damnation. Other sins are lesser sins, uh, and for baptized uh, Christians, uh, they in and of themselves uh, do not condemn them. So, what is the next one? This is an encyclical uh, by Pope Benedict XII, uh, referring to the beatific vision of God and the last days from his Edict Benedictus Deus, the year 1336. He says, Moreover, we declare that according to the common arrangement of God, the souls of those who depart in actual mortal sin immediately after their death descend to hell, where they are tortured by infernal punishments, and that nevertheless on the day of judgment, all men with their bodies will make themselves ready to render an account of their own deeds before the tribunal of Christ, so that everyone may receive the proper things of the body, according as he has done, whether it be good or evil. Quoting 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Pretty clear. Next one, and this one is very disturbing and offensive to many. It is the Council of Florence. Now this is an ex cathedra statement. It is infallible and in order to be Catholic you have to believe this. You might not want to, but you have to. It is infallible. It says, it, it firmly believes, professes, and proclaims that those not living within the Catholic Church, not only pagans, but also Jews and heretics and schismatics, cannot become participants in eternal life, but will depart into everlasting fire which was prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew twenty five forty one, Unless before the end of life the same have been added to the flock, and that the unity of the ecclesiastical body is so strong that only those only to those remaining in it are the sacraments of the church of benefit for salvation, and do fastings, almsgiving, and other functions of piety and exercises of Christian service produce eternal reward, and that no one, whether almsgiving he has practiced, even if he has shed blood for the name of Christ, can be saved, unless he has remained in the bosom and unity of the Catholic Church. Council of Florence, years 1438 through 1445. So, individuals do not have the right to choose which church they want to go to, which religions they want to uh, go, want, want to follow, uh, based on what they like and what they dislike. Like I said, this isn't Baskin Robbins, this isn't the buffet line, this isn't Burger King. Christ only founded one church, it's the Church of Christ, it's the Catholic Church, and that's his mystical body. And in order to be part of Christ, to be in Christ, you have to be a member of his head, of of the body. A body part detached from the body will die, physically and spiritually. And then we have later uh, Pope Pius VI in an encyclical condemning the errors of the Synod of Pistoia. And this is against the idea that, oh, you shouldn't scare people into eternal life. You shouldn't scare people into believing the gospel with hell. That's 
That's not what you want to do. You want to bring them in with love. Well, guess what Pope Pius VI said? He says, The doctrine which in general asserts that the fear of punishment cannot be called evil if it at least prevails to restrain the hand, as if the fear itself of hell, which faith teaches must be imposed on sin, is not in itself good and useful as a supernatural gift and emotion inspired by God, preparing for the love of justice, false, rash, dangerous, injurious to the divine gifts, elsewhere condemned. Contrary to the council of the, uh, the doctrine of the Council of Trent and to the common opinion of the fathers, namely that there is need, according to the customary order of preparation for justice, that fear should first enter through which charity will come. Fear is a medicine. Charity is health. <coughs> so here, Pope Pius VI saying that uh, in order to receive the good news, you have to understand the bad news. You know, the good news is only good because there is also bad news. Because if there's not a distinction between good and bad, uh, then good and bad have no meaning. So the, the gospel, which means the good news, is only good because uh, the problem of sin, original sin by Adam and Eve, which we all inherit by our birth. Even before we choose, even before we know right and wrong, we are already on the path to hell. And that's why Jesus was sent into this world to die on the cross for our sins, to institute the church and the sacraments which save us, namely baptism as the, init the initial means of grace. Uh, baptism uh, remits original sin, and for those uh, who are not infants, uh, sins which are actual sins, it also remits those. It doesn't remit uh, sins of the future. Those have to be confessed and forgiven. So, you know, in a nutshell, those are the traditions of the One Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. So now we have to ask ourselves, is von Balthasar and this famous popular bishop of Los Angeles, have they contradicted Scripture? Have they contradicted the traditions of the One Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church? And anyone with any sense, any mind of the evidence that I just gave to them, if they're honest, they have to say yes. They've contradicted the Catholic traditions, which the Bible is a part of. So, so what of it? Do they have the right to do that just because they're bishops, priests? Do they have the right to do that just because they were a caller, because hands were laid on them? No, they do not. They do not have the right to do that. So that's not a Catholic teaching. So if they reject that doctrine, now perhaps you could say, well, they're not rejecting it outright. They're questioning it. May we dare hope that hell is empty? It's a, it's a rhetorical question, but they don't want to believe that hell is occupied. They don't want to believe the words of Jesus that many enter in the wide gate that leads to destruction. It's an unpleasant thought. I understand. It's not pleasant to believe that. But nevertheless, for me to be faithful to Jesus Christ and to the traditions of the church, I have to believe it. So what, you know, I have to say that these teachings by these clergy, these bishops, they're not Catholic teachings. They're speculation based on philosophical assumptions and also based on the assumptions of evolution, modernism, and that we're more enlightened than we used to be and we know better than 2,000 years of theologians. So, what does this have to do with God? Does that make God angry, vengeful, and mean-spirited? No. God is love, but God is also just. You can't have love without justice, and you can't have love without the truth. So, God's love did not save us. Let me repeat. God did not save us by his love. His love motivated him to save us. What's the famous passage? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son to die for the sins of the world, and that whoever so believeth shall have eternal life. Right? That's a paraphrase. So love motivated the Father to send the Son into the world. But the love itself did not save us. So the idea that the cosmic Christ united himself to the world by virtue of his incarnation, that is another false modernist belief. 
His love sent him into the world, but his justice is what saved us. What does that mean? That means when he died on the cross, he made propitiation and satisfaction for the sin of the world. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John 1, 29. On the cross, he atoned for the sin of the world, original sin and actual sin. He absorbed the wrath of God on the cross. That was justice. It wasn't justice as far as punishing each individual for their sins. He punished his son instead. And he also crushed the head of the devil in doing so, the kingdom of Satan. Uh, so that was just, that's God's justice, that he punished one man for all of humanity instead. So why would God send anyone to hell if he did that? Jesus died for all of us, right? We're all, we're all good. Wrong. Jesus requires commitment and obedience to him. He says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. Jesus made plenty of commandments. He says, why do you call me Lord if you do not do the things that I say? Gospel of Luke chapter 6. Verse 46, and he says, Many will say unto me on that day, the day of judgment, Lord, Lord, did we not do all these things in your name? And he will say, Away with me, you evildoers, I never knew you. And at that time, that phrase, I never knew you, was a phrase by Jewish rabbis of disowning someone who used to be a disciple. So yes, Jesus will disown disciples who are not faithful to his words, who are not obedient you cannot go to heaven without obedience. That's justice. And because God became a human being, the incarnation of Jesus Christ, and he had no sin in him, he was perfect. He did everything. He was perfectly obedient to God the Father. Uh, and he suffered a horrendous death for us. Not that no one else ever suffered crucifixion, but no one else was the eternal Son of God. So it wasn't what he suffered that was so terrible. It was because of who he was. God Almighty became a human being. He lowered himself. He humbled himself in the form of a slave to be a human being, to be a servant. And he fulfilled all of the requirements of the law of Moses, never sinned. And the Jewish leadership at the time, they were jealous of him. They did not like what he had to say. So they had him put to death. They had him flogged, whipped. I'm sure you've all seen Passion of the Christ, how horrible that was. And he died the most shameful death on a cross, which was only reserved for slaves and the worst of criminals. And it was usually in the nude. It was quite humiliating and embarrassing and shameful. So because of that, those who reject the gospel message and the cross of Christ are worthy of the sins that Jesus died for, namely hell. So how do you apply this to your life? You believe the gospel you become Catholic, become a member of his mystical body, and obey the teachings of Christ and the teachings that he gave to the apostles. Do not obey bishops who rupture and contradict the church. That will lead you into hell with them. St. John Chrysostom in the 4th century, he said, The pavement of hell is made of the skulls of the bishops. You know That means they had corrupt bishops in the 4th century too. So I'm sorry I had to deliver this message, but there's a lot of confusion among Catholics and among people in general about the doctrines of hell. Uh, feel free to comment uh, below. Uh, please like and subscribe. Uh, even if you disagree somewhat, like and subscribe anyway. It's good for you. It's good for me. And this is a hearty discussion. Please comment below. Uh, have a great day. Uh, believe the gospel. Repent. Believe in Christ. Be a member of his church. God bless.